this morning's first scripture from the New Testament, from 1 Peter, chapter 2, the first six verses. And if you're using a red church Bible, that can be found on page 1177. Again, 1 Peter, chapter 2, the first six verses. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Today's second scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest kingdom and who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Do you remember when you made all that noise? I remember Brett doing that. You remember, you remember Brett doing that? You got a better memory than I do, Sandy. I love you, Daddy. <laughs> Did he? He still does. But he doesn't say Daddy. He doesn't say, thank God he doesn't say Daddy. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think it's pretty neat that uh, real young children start to, you know, they, they start to feel their voice, you know, and they start to like, they want to be like everybody else, right? <laughs> no. Let's have a word of prayer, right? Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, may you be pleased to use, use this time uh, in our hearts uh, to the glory of Christ, and we pray in his name, amen. So folks, um, in this time of separation, uh, you know, we don't have all the day-to-day -day or weekly um, interaction with some of the saints, but I had a chance to kind of share with Helen, or she, Helen I had a chance to share with me several weeks ago, and how she was at a family event, and she was watching, and make sure I get this right, Helen, but she was watching the little children you know, and how they were taking it all in at the picnic, running around and just kind of absorbing everything, right? And how they were just kind of marveling at the beauty, you know, to, to all the things that we have a tendency to kind of miss sometimes, right? They were so carefree, running, trusting, happy, dependent, you know, you get the picture, right? Maybe, maybe that kind of conjures up some, did I get that right, Helen? Somewhat? Yes, I think you can you learn a lot if you look through life, look at life through the eyes of a child. Helen said that you can learn a lot and as you look at life through the eyes of a child. And that's a huge point here, and that's where we're going, right? Uh, so maybe as I described it, it kind of conjures up some childhood memories, uh, if you go back to your childhood days. So I want you to try to think about that. Um, go back to when we were children. We were very trusting, weren't we? We were anticipating 
We were inquisitive. We were exploring. And we were learning. You know, and we also had this mentality that, you know, as a young kid has, mom and dad has got this. Now, maybe it was just mom. Maybe it was just dad. Maybe it was just mom and dad, right? But mom and dad got this mentality. You know, you didn't have a care in the world, right? We were innocent in many ways to life and the things of the world and to adulthood. And in many respects, that's the way it should be, right? You want kids to grow up and have a childhood. Uh, there was a humility. Now, I use that term in the sense of having a teachable and receptive spirit. We were open to listening and learning up to a certain point, right? You get to a certain point, and then it's like you stop listening and you stop learning um, to our detriment, right? So now I want you to fast forward from childhood to adulthood. Something happens as we get older, right? We grow up, right? We grow up. Now, maybe we grow up, but maybe we don't grow up right. And maybe that's part of the problem. You were kind of like abruptly thrown into the kingdom of this world. You know, I, remember, I can look back yesterday and remember how I went in as a freshman into high school, into this school of like thousands, you know, from a high school of like a hundred and a couple hundred, maybe three hundred, to thousands, right? And then four years later was like a flash. And you're almost like thrust out into this cold world of like, it was quick, right? We lose the innocence and the insulation of being raised as a child. And we often trust uh, the trust and the humility that kind of right out the window. We're not as carefree. We're not as anticipating. We often take for granted the world around us. We're maybe not as inquisitive as we used to be. We don't stop to consider the lilies of the field. We're too busy. We easily miss the beauty all around us. We gravitate toward the mundane, right? You know, off, off to work I go because I owe. That's what we do. We become less teachable over time. And what happens is we, we decrease in childlike qualities and tendencies. And now, here's the... Here's the bittersweet, right? On the one hand, it's good that we grow up. That's the natural progression. You want children to grow up, right? And on the other hand, it's bad if we lose some of those childlike tendencies. Now, I said some. That's the key word. Some. You want to lose some of those tendencies. And there's other tendencies that you want to keep. Now, and many of us would not want to revisit our childhood. If you, if you had a chance, I don't know, to go back into a time machine, you know, step into some sort of time machine and go back, how many would go back to their childhood? More would not. Some would in some ways, right? Right, Jerry? In some ways, right? For a, variety, for a variety of reasons, I, I would suppose that some would not. Like, for example, do you want to be in grade school again? <gasps> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, for some, it's painful childhood memories, right? For others, it's wonderful. Bring mom and dad back, kind of experience the, the picnics and all that. But for some, it's very, very painful. I mean, you know... Uh, one of the reasons why I've never gone back to my high school reunion is I don't want to go backwards in life, right? But who wants to go backwards? I, I do believe many of us would love to recapture the simplicity of some of our childhood experiences, though. I believe that's a given. 
Now, uh, before I get into the heart of what it means to be as a little child, and Helen probably nailed it, like from you know her expression of how she, she presented it, but before I get into that, I want you to notice in, um, in this Matthew chapter 18 passage that the question is asked, uh, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And that's the context of Jesus bringing a little child before the disciples and, you know, teaching some tremendous truths. And, and if, if, I, if my memory serves me right, I know that it's at least on two occasions, maybe even three, I didn't go back to be real super diligent to, to make this point, but at least two, to th two, at least two times, maybe three, this question was asked in a three-year period by the disciples. They seemed to be consumed with who the greatest was. Consider what Matthew has already written in his gospel. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet born among women, Matthew 11, verse 11. Jesus has already spoken of his passion, how he was going to die, Matthew chapter 17. He's already taught on self-denial, chapter 16. And he's already talked, told the disciples that Peter's going to have a big role, a significant role. And they're still consumed with who's going to be the greatest. Do you know that uh, it was, it's been suggested that their question about greatness was really about who was going to be the second greatest in the kingdom? You know, I, it's, I don't think it's an American thing. I think it's a sinful thing. Everybody wants to be number one, right? Tiffany, you, you, you play risk. I hear you're absolutely cutthroat, right? You and I should not play risk together. Somebody will die, <laughs> right? No, seriously. Yeah, you, you talk about being competitive. Who wants to be one? Everybody wants to be number one. Well, if John the Baptist, or Jesus is number one, John the Baptist, I mean, or P Peter, who's, who's going to be second? And, and you know what's amazing? Is they readily missed discipleship and self-denial and kingdom work in lowly service. You know, everybody thinks that, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, I'm going to be in control. It doesn't work that way. Lowly service. Uh, metaphorically speaking, we don't, we don't wash feet, but metaphorically speaking, it's feet, feet washing, foot washing. That's what it is. That's what ministry is. Christ did it. That's what it is. You know, and, and they, the disciples missed the great truth on giving and not getting. The church has missed that today. It's consumer driven like there's no tomorrow. What can I get? What can I get? What can I get? Rather than what can I give? They've missed the lowly service. It's really no different. The disciples glossed over it back then. We gloss over it today in our churches. And, and so it, it, it was about position and status. And to them, position and status was greatness. Oh, I'm the CEO. I'm second in charge. I've got a shirt at home. It's the size of a house. Drew bought it years ago when we were at Fort Bragg. But it talks about how, you know, the general is this, but the sergeant is God, that kind of thing, you know? In other words, who runs the army? It's the people. It's, it's, the, it's the lesser people, not the generals, even though they think that they do. It's the sergeants that keep it all together, right? Dave, you're laughing, right? It's true. But everybody thinks that position and status is greatness. You know, I, I looked at this personally, and I looked at this, tried to look at this from the perspective of just the normal Christian. Who doesn't want to do great things for God? I forget about being number one or two. I'm talking about who doesn't want to do great things for God? Who doesn't want to be used by God to do great things. I think that that is a normal desire 
if you're a believer. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great desire, right? God using us. Oh, that he would continue to do that in great ways. But, but here's, here's the problem. The disciples' understanding of greatness did not fit with the citizen of the kingdom role. They didn't understand it. They missed it. Because that's, that's all the world, right? That's the worldly stuff. And so Jesus, as the consummate teacher and illustrator, how does he answer the question? Because in other places, you know, he somewhat goes after the question. But here, how does he answer it? He grabs a child, brings a little child. This is, this is, this, the child is the object lesson for greatness. And here's the problem. It goes against all the societal and cultural norms. Like, remember in the Old Testament, when, you know, God chose the younger over the older? Jake, you know, Jacob and Joseph's like, no, no, no. You, you can't do that. Right? Abraham was the same way. You can't do that, God. It goes against all of the societal norms and cultural norms, right? It goes against human wisdom and understanding to grab a child and talk about greatness. So I, I want you to picture now, and I don't know how it was, you know, maybe they're out in the countryside, maybe they were sitting, you know, you know off the, uh, the living room, so to speak. I don't know where they were. But they, you know, you have disciples and they're following and, and all of a sudden, you know, the child is brought into their presence how insignificant do you think that that child looked before these grown men? They're learned. Some of them are unlearned. But they're schooled in adulthood. I mean, that child would never know half of what they knew by the time they got to be way older and he was of their age. Right? They have a roughness to them. One collected taxes. You had to be thick-skinned to collect taxes in that day especially if you were Jewish, because you worked for Rome and they didn't like that. And then most of them were fishermen. They had to brave the, you know, the Sea of Galilee. I mean, I don't know how many times they put hooks through their fingers. They were probably rough, very, very rough men, like that's what it is when you go out in a boat, right? Uh, Edie, your son, uh, Lee, is a fisherman, right? There's a roughness to them. And, and so I want you to picture how uh, this child has no standing and no status, right, in that society. How insignificant they are before these men. And that's what Jesus does to teach them. Uh, one, listen to what one scholar said about the lack of standing in society with children. Quote, in the affairs of men, children were unimportant. They could not fight. They could not lead. They had, they had not had the time to acquire worldly wisdom. They could not pile up riches. They counted for very little. It's true. And yet Jesus teaches them that there's something to be learned and gained from children. I think Helen touched on this a little bit earlier when she shared. And, and so I think it's something that we all need to recapture from time to time. Uh, another commentator said, Jesus is speaking to adults. He is conscious of their lost childlikeness before God. He thus gives humility a special nuance. It is to become a child again before God, to trust him utterly, to expect everything from him and nothing from self. Uh, did, let, me, let me go over. Did you hear that? Lost Childlikeness before God, to become a child again before God, trusting Him, depending upon, expecting nothing from self and everything from Him. We have a hard time doing that, a tremendously hard time doing that. The more educated we get, the less we do it. The older we get, the less we do it. And this is the reason for the child as the object lesson. This is the Lord's point. Adults are not very childlike before God, are we? 
I don't want to go back to my childhood days. Some of you do. But it, I tell you what, it is really, really hard to sit there and before God in a very, very childlike way. You know, I'm going to come in I'm all my packaged theology and my learnedness and my sophistication and my education. You throw all that out the window. Uh, we struggle. We struggle to do that, don't we? Humility is elusive. Uh, we're taught to trust in ourselves, in our own strength, our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own self-decision-making, self-reliance. That's the American way, right? And all the like. You know what it is, right? We lose the childlike qualities of trust and dependence and humility that we had with that mom and dad mentality, remember? We lose it, don't we? Now, uh, what we don't use, we lose. And it's, and it's hard to bring those lost qualities back into focus with God. And yet, here's, here's I have to say a word about this. We should lose some of these things in the context of growing up, not always relying upon mom and dad. I find it greatly disturbing when I hear that, you know, men that are 40 and 50 and 60 years old still live with mommy. That's a problem. Or, you know, in, well into the late 20s and early 30s when they're living an irresponsible life. Drew, that doesn't apply to you. <laughs> or Nick. Seriously, it's a problem. It's a huge problem. You, you know, uh, we were talking about this at dinner last night. The more we get away from the Bible and the teaching uh, of God's teaching, everything goes south. We, we coddle, we coddle young, young men and we teach them to be mommy's boys and not teach them to be men at a certain point. And we the same with women, and now you see this tremendous confusion with the genders. I mean, people don't, uh, you know, one guy was ranting and raving, I guess the, I heard the other week, uh, about, uh, he called into a TV program about how his daughter doesn't know whether she's, what she is in terms of gender. She's all mixed up, and he says, I'm done with her. It's crazy, because we don't teach people the way that God wants them to be taught. Our society doesn't promote growing up anymore, does it? 150 years to 100 years ago, it was way different. You had, you had the greatest generation that fought in World War II. And you go back 300 years ago, Drew was telling me that George Washington, uh, George Washington I think it was, by the time he was 11, was given his father's farm because his father died. The mother wasn't given, the, the son was given the farm. And some of these kids, these, I say kids, they had to grow up quickly. They were fighting Indians at 11, scouting it in the enemy territory at age 16. And today, what are our kids doing? Nintendo, 20 hours a day. Are you kidding me? That's why... Our country's in trouble. We don't raise men to be men, and we don't raise women to be women. And they're all confused. You know, I remember talking to a guy, a Christian guy years ago, about the pioneer days. He goes, yeah, that's when men were men and women were men. <laughs> I mean, women were tougher than nails. That's true. They'd crank the shotgun before the guy would. Right? And I understand that life was harder and different back then, but the principles do not change. Now, do they? They don't change. As people grow into adulthood, we should become less dependent on others, and especially mom and dad. And we spread our wings and we grow up and we eke out our own existence. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's what it means in part to become a man and a woman. The other part of becoming a man and a woman of, is, is to become a man and woman of God. That's the other part. Because you can become a man of, of a, and a woman of the world, but that means nothing to God. 
become a, become a man or a woman of God. That's the other part or the other side to the coin. And, because when you, and, and that's been lost, but when we do, then we enter into the kingdom of heaven and then we're able to enter into greatness because then we're able to become like that child. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And what Paul was alluding to was the natural progression from childhood to adulthood to grow up. And he was speaking about putting away childlike immaturities. You know, the Nintendo stuff. That's okay if you want to play games. You know, board games, Nintendo, if you're an adult, that's okay. But it shouldn't be life dominating. Now, you see some stories on the news where people are going to counseling because they've played games 18 hours a day. It's insane. In other places, the Apostle Paul wrote about trusting and being dependent upon God and being humble before God as, as, as his children. So you put away childish things naturally, and yet you want to go back and embrace some of these childlike tendencies. And this is, this is the spiritual paradox. It, it's kind of seem, it's seemingly contradictory, but, but as we grow up into adulthood, we lose the childlike tendencies naturally. But spiritually, we're to grow down and become like children again before God. Because that leads us into the kingdom of heaven. Now, John the Baptist expressed it this way. I love this verse. Uh, he must increase, I must decrease. Uh, it pretty much says it all, doesn't it? Uh, you know, when I struggle with my Christianity, it's because I'm not embracing that verse. When I increase, God decreases, and when he increases, I decrease, and that's the way it should be. And so what happens is, is when we grow down, kind of like go back to that childlike tendencies, we actually grow up. Think about that. When we grow down, we actually grow up. We grow up into all things unto him. And here's the other thing I want you to think about, too. When you were a child and you did things apart from mom and dad, right? You know what I'm talking about. You got into trouble, didn't you? All right. Raise your hands. Who never got into trouble? Everybody got into trouble. When you did something apart from mom and dad, right? You didn't have their blessing or permission. You did it, yeah, you got into trouble, right? <laughs> How many of us, as parents, as adults, get into trouble when we do it independently of our Heavenly Father? Raise your hand. Every hand should be, every, both hands should be up. <laughs> I surrender. It's true, right? And, and so that's very, very true. Now, here's a, here's a spiritual irony of sorts. I'll give you another one. So learning and knowledge, right? We put a prize on that in our culture. You go get educated. You get a degree. And that's going to blaze the trail for you. Maybe. Maybe. It'll open doors for you. But it won't make you necessarily smarter than your next person. You know what make you smarter? God. Do it God's way. You have the education, you do it God's way. You'll be, you'll be smarter than 99.9% .9 of the people walking on planet Earth. So here, here's the spiritual irony, uh, irony of sorts. In our quest to learn and to know, we think that it makes us sophisticated and grown up, right? Just go up to Harvard someday and walk around and, and think about how all the people that walk around there think they're so smart. They, they may be our ac academically, that's why they're at Harvard. Doesn't make them any smarter than you. In fact, you're probably way more smarter than them when it comes to understanding the world. Learning and knowledge can and usually does, listen to this, breed an attitude of self-confidence, self-trust, and I know better, doesn't it? Does all day long, always. 
And that attitude of I know better leads to sin and pride and it easily, don't miss this, it easily and readily keeps people from coming into the kingdom of God because they're so educated and sophisticated and learned and smart. They don't need God or the Bible. Uh, what did Paul say in Romans chapter 1 verse 22? Professing to be wise, they became fools. Uh, again, in 1 Corinthians for chapter 1 verse 20, Paul says, Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Of course he has. Take a look very quickly. I'm, I'm not too far from being done. Take a look at verse 3 here. Um, Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted um, and become like children, right? Unless you are converted, uh, if you have an NIV Bible translation, the word means change. If you are using the New American Standard as I am, it, the word is converted. In the Greek, it literally means unless you're turned. And it means a turn of a hundred, like if you're going this way, it's 180 degrees. It's almost like the word repentance. Repentance is like you're going this way and then you do a 180 degree turn. Well, this, is, this word is not the word for repentance. It's literally turned. But it's like a U-turn, 180 degrees. It's an about face in terms of attitude. It's decreasing in self and placing trust and dependence in God. And, and, and don't miss this point too. The new birth is implied here. Uh, it's, one's, it's a change of one's manners, change in one's ways, believing and accepting that what Christ taught is true. And that's where the education and the learnedness from a formal education perspective. When you go off to these liberal producing factory that we call colleges, Huh. You think you're getting educated? You're getting hosed. Hosed. One commentator, another commentator said, listen to this. Quote, all who are confident in their own kingdom standing should take stock. Is our confidence that of a child trusting the goodness of her father? Or is our confidence in ourselves? That, that quote made me stop to reflect. Here, here's another paradox or an irony of sorts. Becoming as little children. I mentioned a little bit earlier. You want to become great in God's sight? Become like a little child. Childlikeness is what means to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus brought the child uh, as the example of greatness. And, and, and childlikeness is essential, and it should define our relationship before God. And I'm sad to say that it hasn't dominated mine. Some weeks it has. Other weeks, out the window. Um, to become... The word become, become like a child, it implies experiencing a certain state of character and change in behavior. That's what it means. Now, throughout this whole message, Nathan's had his own message, right? That's okay, Nathan. It's okay, Tiffany. Listen, listen. You take a look at Nathan um, or Isla, you know, Danny and Lauren's little girl. They're not here this week our visiting family, but you take a look at those children, right? And use them as an object lesson. Is your relationship with God, like trusting, dependent, humble, expecting everything from mom and dad, like Nathan and Isla do, right? Moms and dads. Is our relationship, is your relationship like that with God? That's what it means to be dependent and trusting and great. It's refreshing. They're carefree. Take the opportunity this week. 
to do what the little kids do, right? Slow down, look at the lilies as Helen. Take everything in, right? I want to leave you with a final thought here. Um, the Greek word for children, it has been translated from infant to older children, right? Maybe up to the age of about, from, from a little infant to maybe age six or seven, okay? Because around six or seven, you know, you start to lose the little bit of innocence, right? Okay. The, f the first application in the Greek is applied to the infant. Uh, a friend of mine, a dear friend, I, uh, I met Ed Miller uh, when I went to several conferences, and I've been down to Ed's house. He's an absolute precious saint. I actually hope to get there sometime soon. Um, and, but he wrote a devotional book a number of years ago, and I like what it says. He says, quote, this word can be translated, get this, infant of days. I like that. And he writes, Jesus had in mind the total reliance of a newborn infant. And as I reflected on that, I thought, you know, I really hope and pray that I can be kind of like that infant of days daily instead of like on one week and off another week, right? Envision ourselves as infants of days in our relationship with God. Uh, I, I want to close finally with another quote from Ed's book. Uh, quote, the church has grown dangerously sophisticated. We need a revival that makes us childlike rather than childish. Oh, for a sweeping move of the Lord on his people that, we, that would result in genuine childlikeness. What a great quote. Childlikeness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, may all of us before you know what it means to be childlike in your sight, uh, that we might not miss uh, the, that greatness uh, that we see in children as they uh, trust and are so dependent and are so expectant and humble as they wait upon their parents. May we be that way in our relationship with you. May we be uh, like uh, infants of days, uh, may we never grow up in that way. May we never lose those qualities uh, before you in our relationship and in your sight. Uh, we thank you for the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for him and his life's work. Uh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is our teacher. We thank you for the way in which he opens up the scriptures to us. Uh, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.